it's a unanimous uh, decision. We have uh, not a report, not an award, not a judgment. This is the Human Rights Commission of Malaysia, so how come panel's final decision in the public inquiry into the disappearance of Amri Chitmat. We deal with the disappearances of uh, a very short introduction of Joshua Hilmi, Ruth Hilmi, Amri Chipmat, and Pastor Raymond Koh. The decision of the panel. Upon a detailed evaluation of the evidence adduced, having read and considered the written submissions of counsel on behalf of the family, assisting officers of Sohakam, Council of the Bar Council and officers appearing for the police, and upon hearing the oral submissions of the parties on 6 March, the panel has arrived at a final decision. After having held lengthy discussions and deliberations in this case, the panel is of the unanimous view that Amri Chipma is a victim of an enforced disappearance as defined in Article 2 of ICPPD <laughs> that took place on 24th November at about 11.30 p.m. The direct and circumstantial evidence in Amri Chipmat's case proves on the bounds of probabilities that he was abducted by state agents, namely the Special Branch, Bukit Aman, Kuala Lumpur. The panel finds that there is no evidence to support the contention as suggested by counsel on behalf of the family that Amri Chipmat was abducted by persons or groups of persons acting with the authorization, support or acquiescence of the state. Grounds of decision. We deal with the law, and uh, without going into details, of course, uh, we have touched on the applicable human rights principles, right against enforced disappearance under international law, right against enforced disappearance under Malaysian law, and the distinction is made between abduction, kidnap, missing persons, and so on. The definition of enforced disappearance contains various degrees of culpability on the part of the state regarding the initial disappearance. The degrees of culpability of the state are listed below in descending order. That the victim was arrested or detained by agents of the state. That the victim was abducted by agents of the state. That the victim was abducted by persons or groups of persons acting with the authorization of the state. That the victim was abducted by persons or groups of persons acting with the support of the state. Or that the victim was abducted by persons or groups of persons acting with the acquiescence of the state. The first degree of culpability is not relevant, which is the arrest and detention by the police. Uh, there's no evidence to indicate that Amri was arrested or detained by state agents in the exercise of their lawful powers. The evidence is that he was taken away or disappeared. As such, the degrees of state's culpability that are relevant are the second to fifth degrees of culpability. Burn of proof in cases of enforced disappearance. Again, the um, conclusion we arrive at on this point is that the burden of proof in cases of enforced disappearances rests with the state. What this means is that the panel is entitled to accept inferences submitted by counsel on behalf of the family of Amri Chikmat, assisting officers, counsel of bar counsel, and um, uh, um, sorry, counsel of bar counsel against the state. It is for the state to adduce satisfactory evidence and give explanations on the bounds of probabilities to show that the state was not in any way involved in the disappearance of the person within the definition of enforced disappearance under Article 2. After dealing with the law, we deal with the facts and uh, we have divided this into two parts. Summary of events before the disappearance of Amri Chikmat. And uh, again, uh, just to mention the subtopics, we have Amri Chikmat practicing Shaism, inspection at Amri Chikmat's home, that's on the 21st of October 2015. We have separate investigations on Amri Chetmat by the Special Branch. Police Hope. And then another section on Shaism in Malaysia. Status of uh, Shaism. We refer to the Shia gathering in Egypt, Perak on the 8th of March 2014. Uh, statements of perception towards Shaism. Meeting between the Mufti of Perlis and the Special Branch. That was on the 7th of October, 2016. Surveillance of Amri Chetmat's home. So that dealt with the events before 
and then the summary of events after the disappearance of Amit Sheikh Mahat. Um, we have um, dealt with the uh, events by uh, referring to um, the efforts made by friends of the family, in particular uh, Isaac and uh, his brother-in-law, Noah Fizal, where they made uh, searches along the road to find out uh, what actually happened. Um, and then uh, a lot of emphasis is placed on the meeting between Sergeant Shamzani and Noor Hayati. Findings of the panel, uh, this is a particular reference to the uh, explanations given by the police. In this, little, in this section, we try to uh, discount the explanations given by the uh, police. The police and all the religious authorities have suggested several possible reasons for Amri Chipmah's disappearance. Namely, that he was facing financial problems either at the instance of his investors in his unlicensed forex trading or from creditors and therefore voluntarily went missing to avoid them. Two, that a disgruntled investor in his forex business or a creditor had caused his disappearance. Three, that the biological uncle of the four children, Amri and Nor Hayati were fostering, was angry with him because he was exposing the children to Shah teachings and had caused Amri Chetma's disappearance. The members of the public were angry with Amri over his Shia activities and it caused his disappearance. And uh, last but not least, that he had entered into a contract marriage with another woman and had run away with her. Um, we have dealt with the various scenarios. We have discounted each and every one of them. Financial problems, uh, foster children, Shia activities, uh, contra marriage. Uh, we find that, as can be seen, none of the possible explanations offered by the police and religious authorities rise above speculation and may be quite easily debunked. In fact, except for Amri's disappearance being connected to his Shia activities, all explanations have been ruled out by the authorities themselves. Next, we deal with the special branch watch on Shiaism and the surveillance of uh, Amri Chitmat. Um, it is a, uh, again, uh, a narrative of what has actually been uh, used in evidence. Uh, on the enforced disappearance, uh, we wanted to be very sure about the issue of identity to make sure that there's no one having any thought to say that it may not have been Amri. It was definitely Amri who was taken away and from the uh, circumstantial evidence, it is more than uh, clear. Uh, very briefly, we say, Nor Hayati, um, uh, the direct evidence of Nor Hayati, who woke Amri up on the 24th at 10.30 p.m. Abdul Jamil, who was to meet Amri that night in Jitra Kedah for Teh Tarek and a chit chat. And the Amri did not turn up, even after he spoke on the phone while on his way to meet Jamil. Saiful Afzan and Said Amri, who witnessed an incident along Jan Panam Bohol, between the traffic lights in Saiful Afzan's restaurant known as Restaurant Maklang. Usually, that a Fortuna, Toyota Fortuna was found abandoned with its windows smashed at a disused construction site in Bukit Chabang, Kedah, and the police confirming that a Toyota Fortuna registered in the name of Noor Hafizal had been found abandoned in Bukit Chabang. So we had no difficulty on identity. As far as the disappearance is concerned, we have dealt with the direct evidence of Saiful Azan and uh, Said Amri. Um, Although Said Azan did not appear before the inquiry as a witness, the statement which was recorded by officers of Suhakam on the 17th of May 2017 was produced and marked as an exhibit. This statement was admitted as evidence. From the evidence of Saiful Azan and Said Amri, there is direct evidence to show, to prove, that on 24th November at 11.30 p.m., three four-wheel drive vehicles were seen boxing in a vehicle along Jalan Parambuho. From the evidence adduced, the attention of Saiful Afzan and his cousin, Muhammad Afiq Adli, was drawn to the incident that happened in front of the restaurant by the screeching of tires and the sound of breaking glass. Saiful Afzan testified that he saw the driver of the box of the boxing vehicle coming out of the vehicle in an attempt to run away from the three four-wheel drive vehicles, but the driver was caught and dragged back into one of the vehicles. At about the same time, Sir Amri was riding his motorcycle approaching from the opposite direction, testified that he saw the vehicle stopped on the road, thinking it was an accident 
Sir Amri rode past and left the scene. An evidence of the guard usury who found Amri's car abandoned at a disused construction site. Circumstantial evidence of Iyak and the surveillance of Amri Chekmat's house. In short, we have the evidence of uh, Iyak who ran a motor repair shop um, and uh, he had noticed that there were three cars that took turns uh, to uh, keep surveillance over Amri's house and uh, this was uh, three days, three consecutive days before the uh, disappearance uh, took place. There's no evidence to uh, doubt or discredit the evidence of um, uh, Viyak. He comes across as a very credible uh, witness. In fact, he took the trouble to record the uh, registration number of a gold Toyota Vios and this number was given to the uh, to, to um, Isaac and to um, um, to Isaac who eventually passed it on to Inspector Ko. Now we, we have quite a few things to say about Inspector Ko uh, a little but the evidence rests that uh, um, a golden Vios was featured in that case up north. The panel recommends the special branch be made accountable and its powers and responsibilities is spelled out in law so they can function impartially and independently and to clearly define the term security to avoid the abuse of power, to further scrutinize the agency and to increase the accountability. Independent Police Complaints and Misconduct Commission, the IPCMC. <clears throat> Council on behalf of the family of Amri, assisting officers of Soakam and on the Bar Council have submitted that it will be an integral part of the primary investigations into the disappearance of Amri Chitmark to investigate the conduct of the police investigations to date. This is based on their belief that the investigations are a sham intended to cover the identities of the abduction, <coughs> identities of the abductors, <coughs> and those behind them, and that if the investigation itself is investigated, <clears throat> those controlling the investigation will be exposed and through them the identities of the abductors may be revealed. This supports a call by the Bar Council to establish the IPCMC so that allegations against the police such as this case can be addressed adequately. Many have called for the setting up of the IPCMC as an independent oversight mechanism for the police since the public, since the public has very little confidence in the police to abide by the rules and regulations and safeguarding the interests of the public. Set up of a special task force to reinvestigate the disappearance of Amri Treatment. Following the panel's findings, it is up to the police authorities to properly investigate and to bring to book the culprit or culprits responsible. Every effort must be made to track down the abductors in a thorough police investigation. For starters, an experienced investigating officer should be appointed to reinvestigate the case. Uh, the police also say the disappearance of Pastor Raymond Ko is connected with the case of Lam Chang Nam, who has been charged in court. And this is interesting. The disappearance of Pastor Raymond Ko is somehow connected with the search and seizure of the exhibits found in the house of Mohammad Fauzi in Tajuddin Fauzi in Pankaran Hulu Perak, who was shot dead by the police in a shootout in Baling Kedah on the 17th of June 2017. Fauzi was suspected to be a drug and firearms trafficker. The police contended that the exhibit seized from the house included pictures of Pastor Raymond Cole, his car and his house at Prima 16 Pataring Jaya. The police believed that Fauzi and his drug trafficking group was the same group involved in the abduction of Pastor Raymond Cole. Decision of the panel. Upon a detailed evaluation of the evidence adduced, having read and considered the written submissions of counsel on behalf of the family, assisting officers of Suwakam, Council of the Bar Council and officers appearing for the police and upon hearing the oral submissions of the parties on the 6th of March, the panel has arrived at a unanimous final decision. After having held lengthy discussions and deliberations in this case, the panel is of the unanimous view that Pastor Raymond Cole is a victim of enforced disappearance, as defined as defined in Article 2 that took place on the 13th of February 2017 at about 10.45 a.m. The disappearance of Pastor Raymond Cole was neither a case of voluntary disappearance 
nor a case of involuntary disappearance in breach of the ordinary criminal law. The direct and circumstantial evidence proves on a balance of probabilities that he was abducted by state agents, namely the special branch Bukit Aman, Kuala Lumpur. The panel finds that there is no evidence to support the contention as suggested by counsel on behalf of the family uh, and of the other parties that Raymond Cole was abducted by persons or groups of persons acting with the authorization, support and acquiescence of the state. Detailed facts of the disappearance of Pastor Raymond Cole. Direct evidence. Based on the direct evidence available, the panel has noted the following. Susanna had testified on the 13th of February at about 8.45 a.m. Pastor Raymond Cole was with her and her son, Jonathan, at her home in Prima 16. Susanna further testified at about 10.15 a.m. Pastor Raymond Cole collected a jar of blachan from her at Punchat Damansana Condominium, which he intended to give to his friend at the Harapan Community Office in Tranajaya. Roshan, the eyewitness of the incident, testified at about 10.45 a.m. on the same morning he witnessed three black four-wheel drive vehicles and two cars, one of which was a gold Toyota Vios and two motorcycles surrounding a car while he was driving along Jalan SS 4B stroke 10 in a residential neighborhood. Subsequently, he saw a struggle between the driver of the car and a few other men who were dressed in black and wore black balaclavas. When Roshan drove his car closer, an Indian man came up to Roshan and directed him to back off from the scene. Following that, while Roshan was reversing his car, he saw a Malay-looking man taking a video of the incident before all the men in the vehicles, including the victim's car, were driven off. Roshan testified that he was driving off from the scene. As he was driving off from the scene, he noticed there were shattered glass, pieces of glass on the road as the driver's window was smashed. Roshan testified that the entire incident occurred in less than a minute. Roshan later lodged a police report about the incident at Klana Jaya at 11.54 a.m. After approximately two hours, Roshan met with one Inspector Ali when he was requested to narrate the incident that he witnessed earlier. Inspector Ali informed Roshan that based on his description, the incident was probably a police operation because it fitted the modus operandi of police operations. Findings of the panel. The modus operandi. On a consideration of the evidence, the panel finds that it was Pastor Raymond Cole who was driving the Honda Accord bearing registration number ST5515D along Jalan SS4B-10 on 13th of February at about 10.50 a.m. when his car was boxed in by three black four-wheel drives and was forcibly removed from his car, after which all the three black four-wheel drives and Pastor Raymond Cole's car were driven off, leaving no one behind. The panel relies on the evidence of Roshan, who witnessed the incident and had testified that he saw about five to six persons being involved in the incident. These persons were fully dressed in black clothes and they were masked. It was contended by counsel on behalf of the family in the written submissions when describing the operations as meticulously and professionally executed with military-like precision. Counsel on behalf of the family in the written submissions contended that the five or six persons involved in the operation were fully clothed in black with balaclavas and they must have been members of the police force. This contention was strongly disputed by IGP Khalid. While agreeing the police, the special units where the officers would be fully clothed in black with balaclavas during an operation, the IGP was of the view that the persons involved in the abduction of Pastor Raymond Cole were not police officers as there was no evidence to suggest that there was a police logo or emblem on the front or back of the black clothes worn by the persons to indicate that they were police officers. The panel is of the view that this is not always the case, that police officers who participated in special operations and who wore or were fully dressed in black clothes with balaclavas had a police logo or emblem on either the front or the back of the black clothes. This can be clearly seen in the video marked as Exhibit 82 of the then Sultan of Kelantan, Tuanku Ismail Petra Sultan Yahya Petra whose convoy was stopped by another police convoy on the 4th of May 2010. Some of the officers of the latter convoy can be seen in the video to be fully dressed in black clothes with balaclavas without any police logo or emblem seen on either the front or the back of the black clothes worn. There can be no dispute that the men in black were police officers taking part in a special operation. 
From the circumstantial evidence and from the information given by Sergeant Samzani to Lori Hati, there was a team of police officers from Special Branch that had carried out the abduction of Pastor Raymond Cole. It was finding of the panel that the disappearance of Pastor Raymond Cole was in fact carried out by the Special <coughs> Branch, Bukit Aman, Kuala Lumpur. Our finding on this search and seizure, the panel finds that the evidence given by the several police officers on the seizure of the items allegedly relating to Pastor Raymond Cole to be full of inconsistencies and material contradictions. The convoluted accounts of how the items allegedly relating to Pastor Cole were seized seemed incredulous and an affront to common sense and logic. What should have been a straightforward account of who did what and when leading up to the seizure of the items has been so distorted that the evidence simply cannot be accepted as being credible. So much time and effort has been wasted just trying to make sense of the evidence adduced. Common issues, I, although I mentioned earlier, but I think it's important to re-mention it here um, in a few paragraphs because I think this ties the two uh, cases somewhat. The panel is further of the view that there are common features between the disappearance of Pastor Raymond Cole and Amri Chetma. The common features that we have taken note of are the following. Religious issues. Um, I've already mentioned earlier about what Pastor Raymond Cole had been doing. And um, uh, as far as Amri Chetma is concerned, um, he was born and brought up as a Sunni Muslim. However, he later took an interest in Shiaism, where the followers hold very contrasting beliefs from those of their adherents of is Sunni Islamic. Amri Chetma was one of the founders of Paliso, an organization that undertakes to assist the poor and needy in the community. However, Paliso was suspected by the then Chief Minister of Paris, Dato Sri Shahid and Qasim, um, and the director of uh, Jaib, Dato Hasman, in the public inquiry um, that, uh, that Paris Hope is a Shia organization. Further, Amit Chikmat home, which is adjacent to the office of Paris Hope, was, in suspect, was inspected by the Mufti of Police, his officers, and together police officers from the special branch, Kanga Paris. The panel finds that Pastor Raymond Ko and Amit Chikmat were both individuals targeted by religious authorities and the police on allegations that they were involved in matters against Islam in Malaysia.